Dan is back from a five-day stint in Mexico Hola. while leaving me out in the cold, cleaning gutters, picking up old ladies, driving to the hospital for a week straight. He's back. He's looking a little bit. He's got a little bit more color than usual. Or I don't know if it's that or the red light, but looking good. How was the trip, my friend? Uh, it was muy bien. Uh, hola, Josh. Como se dice Josh in Espanol? I don't know. Uh, I, I, it was fantastic. It really was Glad to hear it. an incredible time. Uh, truly relaxing. My wife and I haven't been away, just the two of us, for, man, over four years. So there was... Uh, a lot of sexual intercourse. There was a lot of. <laughs> there was I, a I lot of. Would, I didn't think you would go there. That didn't really seem like, <laughs> like it could get or uttered here, but shockingly, it did right away. You know what? We've been married eleven years, and I'm very grateful for what I have. I just want to shout out my wife. She's a wonderful woman. We had an awesome time together, uh, eating, drinking, sleeping. And uh, I, feel, I feel genuinely refreshed coming back. It does suck coming back to this climate, but uh, I'm also fired up about Bitcoin. I got to be dead honest. I, I rifled through the rest of Broken Money, Lynn Alden's nice. new book, On the Beach in Mexico. It got some sand on it, got wet a couple times. It's got some battle scars. But given the current date and time, the climate, the vibes, I am uh, I'm feeling bullish. And when you suggested a an episode specifically dedicated to helping people navigate bull markets, I thought two things. I thought, yes, definitely we need to do it. And and the second mm -hmm. thing I thought, Josh, is we're probably not entering a bull market because you and I both think we are. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I think I get that we like wrote a little piece to talk about this as we go. And that was one of my primary points is when I feel like this thing is turning on. When it really, you know, starts getting, starts getting rock hard, that's when, uh, that's the time that I usually should be pumping the brakes. But as usual, I'll just send this thing and have a long enough time preference that, uh, or low enough time preference that it doesn't really matter because I'm not going to sell this thing in a six months or one year. It's going to be a five year minimum from here. Very, very likely 10 to 20 years. So if we're completely wrong and this thing revisits $20,000, it's not going to affect my long-term holdings or my disposition towards it you know what i'm saying like that is one of the most important points we need to get to just about how and why you can put yourself in a position to have that mentality because if you don't have that mentality you will get shaken out of this asset in a hurry people will put their tail between their legs and run for the hills when uh when the shit gets rough and the, and the rocks start getting slammed into by the boats you're on 100 percent. I th yeah. this thing this this whole bitcoin thing which you and i have been up to for six years Boy, does it elongate your time preference, man. And yes, I think does. a lot of people feel that they're strapped in for the long haul, and then practically they're not. And there are a ton of folks, <clears throat> everybody probably still listening to this show, interested in Bitcoin, can think of a long list of people that thought that they were interested in Bitcoin in the last bull run, and they aren't here anymore. I'll tell you one thing, though, they're probably going to be back. They will be the people back on Twitter with that, <laughs> with those, with that smiling face or on YouTube with their smiling face and their TA analysis telling you that this thing is, you know, either going to 10K or going to 350,000 tomorrow when you have to buy it or sell it right now, probably at the worst time you could be doing it. Yep. Um, and yep. Twitter will get very feisty and spicy and you'll be seeing all the people come out of the woodwork that you haven't heard of in three years who have been concerned about AI or uh, frog JPEGs or apes or any of those things, they will be back. And we will see very likely some new derivative of those clown ideas pop up. It's hard to say what it's going to be. I have no idea at this point, but we're keeping our eye out for what kind of bullshit goes on in this next bull market. Clown derivatives will clown persist. Derivatives. They will permeate. Speaking of that, we have been trying to get Eric Wall on this for quite a while because I just find him Number one, he's a super intelligent dude who disagrees with a lot of what we agree with. Would love to talk to him about some of this stuff. And he seems kind of butthurt that we called him clown, even though he was wearing a wizard outfit at the Bitcoin conference. Even though and he literally, I want to get him on here clown. and hash this out, man. I really do. I keep yeah, DMing him. He keeps ignoring. We'll see. If anybody's yeah, got other... a hook on him, let him know. We want him on this show. 
we did we did walk back a lot of that too. Our initial yes. impression at the conference was that the whole Taproot Wizards thing was a complete joke, and this whole NFT on Bitcoin thing didn't make. But his angle on this <clears throat> is very different than it first yes. appears. He has to admit though that he's showing an initial appearance that's not reflective of the depth of the idea and the importance of the theme. And I think one of the main things him and Udi were expressing at that conference, not to go down this rabbit hole too far, was just this can be done on Bitcoin. If we don't do it, someone else is going to do it. And so those of you that are concerned about the state and future of this decentralized global ledger need to be paying attention about what can be put on this right. decentralized global ledger. And guess what? I can put fucking wizard pictures on there. Exactly. So, uh, Anyways, Eric Wall, we want you. Uh, dude, we're going to be on so many. I'm already feeling as we get going on this, we're going to be on so many tangents. It's I not know, even, we, we're not even going to be on theme. But wait, before we get into it, I want a little update on your side. What happened while I was in Mexico? I have not had mm. enough Josh. Oh, I wanted to ask you. Yeah, go ahead. I wanted to ask you, number one, because the last time, well, I guess the last time I went to Mexico, everything was good for an all inclusive, but this is like five years ago now. We went to the Dominican and I got, I don't know what what i got i either got ethanol poisoning mm. or i got Ma food from some or poisoning Ma montezuma's from some, like, revenge crap. probably like, dude i had like i had like a four-day period where i thought i was gonna have to get like medevaced out of the dominican republic because i was dying just shitting my pants for four days straight you didn't have anything like that go on down there you didn't drink the water no i actually am feeling great however <laughs> i have gotten montezuma's revenge in the past went on a missions trip in high school Ooh. and got back and it was horrendous now one experience i had down there i ate a whole jalapeno pepper seeds and all on accident uh i had this i got this you know little bowl i, I like spicy food for a caucasian dude i push the boundaries of spice and i got yeah. this little medley of peppers forked it ate it may or may not have had you know, some pina colada, wasn't paying a ton of attention, went in for lunch. And what ensued over the next 30 to 40 minutes was by far the most intense spice experience I've ever had in my life. I was in legitimate pain. At one point, Polly was worried about me. I was playing it cool over in the corner, but I was bread, milk, water, absolute panic. And I was sitting there thinking, oh my God, there are people that are actually comfortable eating these peppers. And it yeah. came out and much worse. It came out just as spicy as it went in. It was a full blown <laughs> you could experience. Could identify by the tracers from the seeds coming out. Yeah. Oh yeah. Nice. Another wait. Another observation I wanted to make about my time in Mexico before we get into the meat and potatoes. And I don't know if this was your experience the last time you were down there. I want to. The way I'm going to call it is the inverse fat confidence bell curve of the people mm. that go to these pools and beaches. If you are fit and you look great. You're confident. You've got thongs and bikinis, dudes and speedos strutting around. Then if you're moderately overweight, you're carrying, you're carrying, let's say, 20 to 50 extra pounds. People get insecure. You'll see the long sleeve <laughs> shirts. You'll see a more typical swimsuits, women in one pieces. Yep. But then if you're if you're really overweight, right, you're you're 50 you to 150 fun. pounds overweight. People are back to flaunting it. I mean, huge fupas and bikinis. Massive Jesus. beer bellies and speedos. The level of confidence it's, of some of these massively obese Homo sapiens strutting around just with their body out is both admirable and disgusting. Yeah, dude, that sounds like you're describing a Midwestern water park at like Wisconsin Dells. <laughs> that sounds like what you're describing there. Noah's because, Ark or Great Wolf Lodge. Yeah, dude, there oh, are yeah. some corn fed hogs that walk around those places strutting around with a hundred extra pounds on them with a fupa. You're not even sure if they're wearing bottoms because they're not they're not visible. Their folds are literally just blocking blocking the entire bottom. It's it's a challenging experience to wade through when you're going to those indoor water parks, man. You've been yeah. there, I know. I know you're familiar. It's no, motivating. For me, man, it's been it's been nose down, dude. I've been picking up old ladies, putting out fires, cleaning gutters. My little side business is a gutter cleaning company and we are slammed this time of year and then I took on like a complete asshole an entire home renovation project that I'm working on in between all of that shit. So I'm just, I've been slammed. I need to get to Mexico, bro. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Yes, I will yes. guide you. Uh, okay, oh, our I'm gonna friend that we talk about often, though, I will tell a quick story about him. We were out. He was with me, one of the guys we work with, cleaning gutters the other day at this 
we have this large association tract of like 40 giant condominium buildings. We're cleaning all these gutters and he's got to take a shit like every five minutes. He's like a goose. This guy leaves for 45 minutes, comes back. I'm like, dude, it took you that long. And he's like, sorry. And then he, he has another one like an hour later. He just straight up grabs a toilet paper roll and walks into the woods next to these association buildings, drops trow like a complete degenerate animal and shits in the woods. A gr- like this, this guy's in his mid thirties. He's not like a college kid. He's not a teenager. Like he shits in the woods on the regular when we're gutter cleaning, just an animal barn animal yeah. gorilla. Yeah, that's uh, that's Josh's other business partner that was just described right there. Yeah, he's a real he's a real solid individual overall. He just shits where he stands. He'll shit into a 20 ounce water bottle. I've I haven't seen him do that, but I don't doubt he would do it. (laughs) Okay, here's the impetus behind this episode. I'm going to give a little context. Josh put together a long list of incredible ideas of basically suggestions of how to navigate the bull market before we click record i put the pressure on him i'm basically going to insist that he turns this into an article because it's got some great ideas so josh i think i'm going to let you kind of take the lead i'll play back up and the goal here is just for us to cover a variety of themes for how we suggest you navigate accumulating and holding and dealing with bitcoin when it surges upward that could be happening now That may be not happening now, but it's very likely in our estimation that it's going to happen at some point in the future. And it sounds unbelievable. And it is great if you've been stacking Bitcoin. It sounds easy, which is the key. And it's not necessarily as easy. It's not easy. And it it comes with it comes with stresses. And and there are suggestions we're going to give you. We have not been around as long as many, many people in this space, but we have been here for six years now. We've lived through two full cycles. If another cycle happens, this would be our third. And we're just going to share from the heart some ideas and thoughts we have. Uh, Josh, Mm. you lead us off. Where do you want to start on suggestions for navigating a Bitcoin bull market? Well, thank you for that. Very well put together introduction, Daniel. That was that was beautiful. Um, Thank you. I thought maybe it would be best to start at the beginning, kind of describe what happened in my world when I in July of 2017, found this thing, started having some understanding of what it is, but mostly just saw this as an opportunity that this is something that makes a lot of sense, number one. And number two, it seems very likely it's in this bull run that's going to make me a lot of money in fiat terms, which is all I was concerned about at the time, which is a very common theme. Most people, when they get involved in this market or any of this crypto stuff, it's all about how much bottom line dollars am I going to come away with in six months or one year or however long I want to play this game of tra- trading. So in 2017, it, be- it started out with, I'm interested to disbelief at the amount of value that was accruing so quickly from July mm. till even a month later, it went up like a thousand dollars. It was like 40, 40% up <clears throat> in the first month I owned it. And then it's, I'm a genius. I figured something out that a lot of people didn't figure out here. And then it became imperative for me that I back up the truck and I take every available dollar that I have and start plowing it into this thing. So then it's degen buying with every single dollar I could muster together. Mm. Then as this thing at the end of 2017 in December, when it broached that parabolic top, I watched a shitload of the money that I had quote unquote made vaporize over the next, actually it's funny. I was in Mexico at an all-inclusive in January of 2018, watching this thing, I remember very clearly going from like 9,000 to 8,000 to 7,000. It was like gut-wrenching, horrible shit to be sitting and watching, having very little true understanding about what it is that I own, and also being separated by thousands of miles from the keys that would allow me to sell. <laughs> it, was a, right. it was a tough experience, you know? Yeah. And so many would say, and I would agree that you weren't really losing anything, but that is all about mindset. Mm. If you come into this understanding that you're holding this for the long term, when it goes down in fiat terms, it doesn't really matter because you're looking to hold this thing for five years or whatever. But when you have that first impetus to buy this, you're generally trying to do it for quick gains. And then it's very easy to get shaken out. I had a neighbor at the time who... And I was talking, and Dan can vouch for this. I was talking about Bitcoin constantly. It was a, an obsession, as it still is. But 
on a more keen level at that time, because whenever you're introduced to a new idea, it's fun, it's engaging, it's exciting, and there's so many avenues to explore. I wanted to tell everybody, and at the time, my neighbor was an older gentleman, probably in his mid-50s, and he listens to my spiel, and he goes, listen, I've been here before, not with crypto, but I was involved in the dot-com boom heavily, as it sounds you are with this. And he was like, I rode this thing, and I don't know what he bought specifically, but it was just a, a bunch of dot-com stocks. He's like, I rode this thing up. I made more money than I ever thought I would have in my life. And I watched it all disappear. I rode all of it back down, probably not to zero, but very low levels. Didn't make any money. He's like, I think the best thing you can do, and I know nothing about Bitcoin, but I think you should take 50% and sell it and sit on the other side and let it do what it does from there. He's like, at least you've taken your money off the table. That isn't advice that I would necessarily give to people, but it's not a bad idea when you don't have a full understanding of what you own. And I think that's an important point here. Yeah. Yeah. I think you've broached a couple themes that are really important. One of which I'm going to round back to in a second, which is the whole unspeakable idea of profit taking. And a lot of Bitcoiners would be like, you never that take profit in Bitcoin. Said. What are you going to buy fiat with it and stocks? Like, I'm going to double back to that in a second, because I think we are going to challenge that a little bit, which may surprise some of our audience. The first thing you hit, though, that I think we have to get out there, and I encourage the audience to really internalize and think about is how much your emotions grab you in these markets. You've invested a lot of time. You've invested a lot of capital, which is your own hard work. Your future gets wrapped up in this. If you really get grabbed by Bitcoin, a lot of the value you add in the world ends up getting siphoned into this digital protocol. And you're going to get emotional, both on the ups and the downs. Emotions will grab you. And I think it's important for, for people to realize that your emotions are the same as other people. Like when you're feeling euphoric, the market is probably also feeling that way. And I think that's one of the things that surprised, has surprised me the most in my Bitcoin mm -hmm. journey is how much of a patsy and a pawn I am. How much my feelings move in the same direction as the general investing populace. And in a lot of ways, that's humbling. And we've compared notes on that a lot of saying, often what we feel is happening, we need to do the opposite, which is exactly. back to kind of the initial point of this exactly. episode of the fact that we feel like this thing's about to rip. Maybe it's about to cut back down to 17,000. So yeah. a utmost caution about your own emotions, because um, you're if you've spent thousands of hours, hundreds or thousands of hours, you're going to sit here in this bull market thinking it's fucking happening. It's fucking happening. Hyper Bitcoinization is here. I've mm. read all this stuff. Sovereign debt loads are out of control. The fiscal situation is unsolvable. Blah, blah, blah. It's happening. Every these time things, that happens. These things tend to happen slower than you expect. You're probably, we could eat our words here and Bitcoin can rifle to a number that has our jaws on the floor, but you're probably going to be convinced the price is going to go higher than it does, is my guess. So just be, be wary of this. Invest for the long term. We're going to, I'm sure, hit this theme also later on. But both in bull markets and bear markets, I grow increasingly convinced that taking emotions out of it in the way that you purchase Bitcoin and setting up dollar cost averages yes. is the best way to mitigate the tripwires that your own emotions set for your investing. This is true of Bitcoin. This is true of tons of different assets. Yeah. Then, then I think I'll I'll hand it back to you to let's talk a little bit about this profit taking. I think there is it needs to be discussed. If your net worth goes up orders of magnitude, life is short. Life is compressed. There are reasons to spend money back into the real economy. And if you have windfalls that you didn't expect, there's going to be life goals. There's going to be reasons to take profit. Neither one of us is ever going to say that you should get rid of all your Bitcoin and enter fiat land or ever stop sure. buying we and will, accumulating. We will revisit this in a little bit, but it is important when you... So I, I think there's kind of two different ways when you take profit to think about this. If you're buying assets, if you're buying other things that are valuable, 
that you believe will have value in the future, just to kind of take risk off because you don't want to be 100% invested in anything. I think that's a smart decision. But if you're planning to buy a green Lamborghini with your gains, that is something you should think about deeper because that thing is just a liability that is going to go down in value versus the Bitcoin you sold off for it. And, you know, that's not a position that most people will be in, unfortunately. But I'm, all I'm saying is don't buy toys and junk with your gains. Like try to reinvest these things in things that are valuable and will become and maintain their value in the future. Not to say you shouldn't enjoy yourself, but do it with a modicum of um, moderation. You know, yeah, don't, I guess don't, that, don't I guess... blow your whole stack on bullshit. Totally. Dan and I are paramedics. We see people day in and day out who have one major concern, insurance. They either have no insurance or they have some inadequate insurance that doesn't cover a thing while sticking them with a huge premium. They're worried about the cost of the ambulance and the hospital. Sometimes they refuse to be transported to the hospital for urgent needed care just because they don't have insurance. This is where CrowdHealth comes in. CrowdHealth is not health insurance. It's better. You contribute every month to a fund that covers you and assists other members in need. If you ever have a significant health issue, you can get crowdfunded. You pay the first $500 and then the community will step in to help you out. CrowdHealth will negotiate on your behalf to obtain the best price possible. If you're sick of overpriced and underperforming insurance companies, try CrowdHealth. Support humans, not giant healthcare corporations. You can try it starting at $99 per month for the first six months if you use code BLUE. That's code B-L-U-E. Have you been paying attention the last few years? If so, you know one thing. Not your keys, not your coins. This is a quaint saying, but it's real. If you're not holding your seed keys, you have a Bitcoin IOU, not Bitcoin. CoinKite is the maker of the cold card Mark IV. This is the industry standard for holding the keys to your Bitcoin. Holding your keys should not be intimidating, and it isn't. The Mark IV makes this an incredibly simple process. You could be a degenerate firefighter and hold your own keys. That's how simple it is. If you want to create a more complex setup, the cold card Mark IV has you covered there as well. You can create a multi-sig using a cold card, a tap signer, and even the upcoming Q1. Speaking of the Q1, if you want to have every bell and whistle and give yourself no boundaries as far as interacting with Bitcoin is concerned, the Q1 is your signing device. CoinKite makes some of the most sought after gear in Bitcoin. The block clock, seed plates, the open dime, and the sats card. Everything you need to secure your Bitcoin. Click on the link in our show notes to get discounts at the CoinKite store or use code BCB for 5% off the Mark IV. Totally. And that's relative to the to the size stack you have. Like if someone's sitting on $38 million worth of Bitcoin, maybe buy the green Lamborghini if that's always been your dream. But sure. practical applications for people that have been stacking hard with good cash flow and have a lot of money wrapped up in Bitcoin. I mean, if you've got short-term life goals like a kid's wedding, paying for kid's college, as you said, taking risk off the table and diversifying, maybe a vacation you've always wanted to take, getting out of unproductive debt, giving generously, and you're doing this with a small percentage of your stack or a moderate percentage of your stack where you're still in good shape with the rest of it, you're not a criminal for doing that. I, I also think... I think one of the messages to deliver here as we sit at this date and time is having some form of a profit taking plan if you intend to do that. Not everybody's going to intend to take profit. We're not saying everybody needs to. If you're already diversified, we agree. We think we're in the first innings of this thing. But like mm. I've heard someone say something to this effect. My plan when Bitcoin surges next is when a quarter of my stack pays off X or Y. Your house, the student for debt, my house, yeah, right. blah, blah, blah. When, it, when a quarter of my stack pays off X debt, I'm paying off the debt. Just an example of a profit-taking plan that once again takes some of the emotions out of it. But I yes. think the general higher theme we're, we're communicating is don't feel like a criminal for taking some profits and cycling some Bitcoin back into the economy if you mm. feel that's prudent. Because <clears throat> there, there's no reason to be some monk Bitcoin martyr who never spends a sat and lives this incredibly frugal lifestyle sitting on a massive nest egg without a chair. You're not even without a chair. At, yeah. I mean, what Dan's driving at there too is like life is short. Enjoy yourself to the degree that is reasonable. 
that you can afford and you can maintain a lifestyle that is good. You just don't want to blow all your bull, all your money on bullshit. And I am when I think about this, I think back to a book. A lot of people have read it. It's probably one of the most or the most popular finance book ever written. Robert Kiyosaki's Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Mm. And in that book, if you learn anything from it, I think the primary thing you come away with is his idea and his definition of what an asset is and what a liability is. And it's very different from the traditional um, CPA definition of what those things are. In his mind, an asset is something that you buy and then it has a cash flow and it accrues value. It's something that can basically build your wealth. Anything, an asset is anything that builds wealth. It could be real estate, rental properties, it could be gold, it could be Bitcoin. It could be just the S&P 500. And then liabilities on the other side of that are bullshit toys like your Lamborghini, your Porsche, your vacation home in the Hamptons or something like those are liabilities because they cost you money. There's maintenance costs associated with that at Hampton. I don't know why we're talking about Lamborghinis in the Hamptons here, but <laughs> but yeah, nevertheless, yeah, we are. Wait, wait, one one quick anecdote that's funny. And by the way, if you're listening and you're going, fuck you guys, I don't have much Bitcoin at all. God damn it. And we're trust also, me, neither of us have also gonna to be buying those things either. So we're also going to talk to you later in the episode of of the regret and the disappointment that you don't have enough. We're going to talk to that segment of the yes, audience too. Sorry, go sure. ahead, Josh. Um, <clears throat> no, all I'm getting at though is it's a very simple proposition to have in your mind. Like if you're buying something that you know will not accrue value and will cost you money over the long term, it's not necessarily a great idea. If you're buying something that can have a cash flow, one of the things though that he really the thing I love about the way he presents these ideas is he's like, don't put yourself in a position to be penniless and destitute, even though you're rich. He's like, buy a cash flowing asset and then buy the fucking Porsche and pay the payment with the cash flowing assets revenue. Mm. You know what yeah. I'm saying? So you don't have to live like a fucking monk. You can, you can position yourself in a way that you can have all your toys and you can have the assets that accrue value for you and you can live a great life. Right. I think another point here that just dawned on me is I'm going to say, don't dupe yourself into thinking you're rich when you're not. Okay. If you've mm. never had much money and th th this can be seen across many segments of society, demographics that, that tend to be more impoverished when this is a broad generalization, but I think it, it holds true. And I can even think of examples in my own life. Demographics that typically don't have much money, when people have windfalls, they feel rich and they end up doing tons of dumb shit. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm just going to throw out numbers and these are going to be American middle upper class numbers. So they may sound really privileged to people in other parts of the country, but let's say your Bitcoin stack ends up going up to $300,000. You are not independently wealthy with $300,000. $300,000 is awesome. It's absolutely wonderful. I'm super excited for you that your Bitcoin went up to that number. But that is not have you set for the next 30 years. And don't think that way. And close. I think some of that piggybacks on what you're saying. There are people whose Bitcoin stacks are going to go to numbers where they never have to work again. Most of us are not going to be in that position. And the mindset you should have is, Man, this is wonderful that I was able to get access to this asset asset so early and I'm going to use what I made here for more productivity and to to continue to compound my nest egg moving forward. Yeah. Just because a number makes you feel awesome doesn't mean it has you set for for 20 or 30 years. Stay productive. Keep your skill set up. For sure. Fill a need in the marketplace. Even, continue even to have, have robust cash flow because just because the Bitcoin number went up a lot doesn't mean it has you completely set for life. And I, I guess I caution sure. people to think that way. I think that you should be cautious, even if your number is an order of magnitude greater than that, even at $3 million. Right. I wouldn't be comfortable walking away from a solid career with that for a couple of reasons. Number one, Bitcoin's very volatile. And if you're going to hold that $3 million in Bitcoin, you need to keep a cash flowing job on the side just to make sure that you're going to be okay. Because Living on $3 million in this day and age, if you want to be ultra conservative and you want to take it out and you want to invest it in a reasonable assortment of S&P and like treasuries and stuff that are going to be safe, you could still see massive volatility in those markets in the coming decade. And they may not be spitting off much for you to live on. I mean, in terms of like inflation in the background and all the other crazy stuff that can go sideways in the world, 
I love the idea of keeping as many small businesses, as many income streams as possible while letting the stack grow. I encourage everybody listening to do something, whatever it is they can do. I mean, I have been cleaning gutters with a buddy of mine for the last seven years. I don't enjoy doing that at all. It pays well and it's allowed me to accrue a lot more, a lot more assets than I would have otherwise done. Just do something. You could go pressure wash houses. You could you can just build a small business that doesn't have to kick off a shit ton of money, but everything it does kick off is pure profit for you. Um, yeah. I encourage you to increase your resiliency through small businesses, through asset accumulation. Be tenacious about the building as much as you can while you're in your productive years. Regardless of how big your stack gets. I exactly. love it. Don't don't let don't let a, a ballooning Bitcoin price have you take your foot off the gas. Have it sure. prompt you to put your put your foot down further. <clears throat> this does transition into one of the points I had written down, which the headliner was: don't make a dumb vocational decision in a Bitcoin bull market. <laughs> That's a, so what what we what we just said was I love that one. A, don't quit your job or or take your foot off the gas. Right, if you're someone that continues to buy real estate properties, keep doing that. Do that even smarter with more precision and more capital, right? W whatever that is. And so the, the main idea I had, though, with this bullet point was a lot of people in Bitcoin bull markets get really, really, really obsessed and excited about Bitcoin as we have. And they feel compelled to work in Bitcoin. Um, shout out to Andy Edstrom, by the way, because at Pacific Bitcoin, him and I were sipping old fashions at a party and we were talking about this and how we absolutely celebrate Bitcoin companies and we're excited for all the people that want to work in Bitcoin, but we caution everyone from pe feeling compelled to do it. And I'm going to give a couple reasons why. There are many careers in Bitcoin uh, and it will be a blossoming industry with, with a really robust and growing application layer. but. A Bitcoin world is, first of all, far less financialized. For God's sake, it's an automated accounting system. It disintermediates a lot of human beings who move money around. So a little bit of caution getting into the financialization of Bitcoin because it's, it's very de-financializing. There will be Bitcoin financial services companies, but the competition is different. And the number of jobs that it will create and allow for is going to be different than in the fiat system. Additionally, Bitcoin startup land. Bitcoin mining, content creation, they are viciously competitive and cutthroat, right? So if one of those three mm. things is like, I want to start a podcast and provide for a family. Good luck. Awesome. Start, start it as a hobby in your basement, but we're, we're just going to tell you after doing this for almost three years, it is, we're glad we're firemen. We're glad we do this on the side. Pe people ask us at these conferences, Josh, like, so when are you guys going to quit firefighting? And we're like, uh, <laughs> we're never, like, never, uh, never. <laughs> because a, there's no even fucking way I'm going to depend on this. A, this thing makes less than people think. B, it's very momentary and temporary. Like, it's just so competitive. Everybody and their cousin's mother has a Bitcoin podcast. Just, just mm. as one example to talk about our world. So, like, there are people that we know of in this last bull run that went all in Bitcoin, both with their investments and with their vocation. And I know that some of those people currently regret it. I think that the term fiat mining is way overused. Fiat mining has basically just become in the Bitcoin land, having a job. Like, like, and so I, I think we would encourage you, if you enjoy what you're doing, even if you don't, and it provides for your family, stick with it, have some staying power, add value somewhere in the broader marketplace and stack mm. Bitcoin on the side. Not discouraging. Absolutely. If you work in Bitcoin, awesome. If you really feel like you're a market fit for a company or you have an awesome startup idea, go for it. I'm just cautioning people from getting overly obsessed and then making a dumb vocational decision because they're so excited about Bitcoin. Bitcoin is yeah. really intended for people to do normal productive things in society and stack Bitcoin with their positive cash flow. Absolutely. And it's and basically what you're outlining there is don't put all your eggs in one basket. Don't have your income stream, your investments, um, every single thing that you do to acquire financial benefit in this life mm. be associated with Bitcoin because yeah. there's no guarantees in this world. You don't want everything betting on one horse, every single thing in your life betting on that one horse. It's okay to bet strongly with strong conviction, but it's a very different thing to have your entire well-being tied to an asset 
one single asset in a sea of different things to choose from. Not that Bitcoin is not a good thing to bet on. I think it's an incredibly, incredibly good thing to bet on. I want to get over to one of my most, one of my favorite points of this whole thing, which is nobody knows what's going to happen here. Nobody. <laughs> yeah. I have been in this, Dan's been in this as well for six years going on seven. We have heard everything from every end of the spectrum, from people that we had great respect for who were completely wrong time and time again on both ends of the spectrum. Um, well, a recent one, Balaji comes to mind. He called Bitcoin to $1 million. And I believe that this was, I like to think that this was just to get attention. I don't know what the whole impetus for this was, but he got attention for sure. But he's calling for $1 million in three months earlier this year, like January of 2023. He was saying it's going to be a million in three months. Well, clearly that didn't happen. On the other end of the spectrum, you've got Nobel, Nobel laureates saying that this thing's going to zero because they've put in absolutely no work to understand what this is. <laughs> yeah. You've got guys like uh, Buffett and Munger, who we have great respect for in many avenues. Probably 99% of the investing world, those guys are light years ahead of the two of us, clearly. They're billionaires. But they haven't put in the work or they've just jumped the shark with their age. I mean, they were like 90 years old. I get it. They call Bitcoin rat poison. And I mean, they do also have a massive portfolio of banks. So you can see that they have a bit of a, you know, a little bit of a problem liking Bitcoin when it completely disintermediates a third of their portfolio. But what we're getting at here is there is a bit of survivorship bias, a lot of it in this market. The people that have been right for years, some of, they're all very intelligent. I'm not knocking them at all, but you have to keep in mind in all these things and all investing. In life, there is just a survivorship bias that exists, which means the people that have made it, that have been right, are always the prominent voices because out of the sea of people that were making these calls, they happen to be the ones that were right consistently. It doesn't guarantee that they're right the next time. It's like the way Bitcoin mining works. It's basically a giant lottery. If your machine won the lottery last round, that doesn't mean that it has a better chance of winning the next one yes. or rolling dice. Like because I rolled seven six times in a row, the probability of seven coming up one more time is the same. Just because it happened six times in a row doesn't make it any more likely it will happen the seventh time. Survivorship bias has filled graveyards of people that we've never heard of and that are, I mean, probably not pennies, penniless and destitute, but are just never heard of because they just never made it. Yeah. It, Peter. It's kind of an engagement Hail Mary too. I mean, Balaji's are really well established, but you're going to have TA bros throwing out specific price predictions just to hope that in the off chance it hits, they become kind of famous. I mean, it to, to getting attention out there on the Internet is so challenging and people are are getting real slutty. They're showing some serious titty because it's hard to get attention. You have to get more slutty out there and more risque. And so. People are doing that. Oh, if I predict Bitcoin's going to 650,000 and I bark all the time and then it goes somewhere remotely close to that, guess who's I'm got a, a huge social media following? You have more to say on this and I want you to keep saying more. My main mm. point was ignore TA, ignore people that are throwing out price predictions. It, it's okay to postulate and sometimes it can be fun, but in terms of making any sort of long term investing decision based on what some random dude somewhere thinks that the lines are saying uh, it, it's yeah. just proven so well, unproductive in our mind. I kind of outlined two different crystal ball holders and the two of them are technical analysis and people who are using nothing but numbers and lines on a graph, which, so, I mean, not to get deeply into this, they're basically mapping human psychology. That's the yes. underlying idea, right? They, they can tell when things are getting a little bit too bubbly at the top and they can kind of tell when everyone's kind of given up on the bottom and for those two signals it's probably a pretty good indicator but the problem is is that there are so many people that don't use that in tandem with say macro analysis and more fundamentals there's a lot of people out there who simply look at lines on charts and make calls and they can be right they can be wrong but it's astrology for men in a lot of ways it's so there's so much bullshit thrown into that and i believe it it's a lot like the fed when Jerome Powell gets up there and he blabbers on using words that a lot of people don't understand, and every single time they talk, they have a new technical word or phrase that nobody really knows the definition of, 
it's there to baffle and befuddle you. So you just say, oh, well, I'm not smart enough to understand this. So that guy must know what he's talking about. Therefore, I'll just believe him. TA has that in spades. It is full of jargon and bullshit. And it's just, in my view, and from my experience, has been wrong time and time again. Have you had the intention to mine Bitcoin, but thought that the equipment is too expensive or that running your own miner might be a bit too technical? Maybe you thought it would be cool, but the cost of electricity where you live makes it pointless. With HeatBit, you can kill three birds with one stone. It's a Bitcoin miner, a heater, and an air purifier all in one. It's a plug-and-play device that could not be simpler to operate. It has the latest 5 nanometer chips to make it one of the most efficient Bitcoin miners in the world. On average, the HeatBit Mini pays for 70% of the electricity it uses. The HeatBit Mini also operates quietly. Good luck selling the idea to your wife that you're going to plug in Bitcoin miners in your basement that operate at the volume of a lawnmower. Not going to happen. HeatBit operates silently while keeping your significant other warm and cozy. HeatBit cares about your marriage. So, if you want to mine Bitcoin and remain married, order a HeatBit Mini and keep warm while it pays for its own electricity bill. Visit HeatBit.com and use code BCB for 5% off a HeatBit Mini. Yeah, and if here's the, here's the troublesome thing about trading in general and technical analysis. I do think it tends to work a lot. In terms of short and medium term, it can get movements somewhat accurate. The problem is when it bitch slaps you, it knocks you out. Mm. It is kind of my assessment is you'll get nine, nine, you know, it's going the Fibonacci's here or whatever. You, nine times in a row, you'll be sort of right or nine out of 10. But then that 10th or 11th time it flips the other way on you. You're in for a fucking roller coaster. And a lot of people just it's it's just it's back to the general theme of trading too much. I think mm. watching charts incessantly causes people to move money around. Yes. OK. And when when human beings move money around too much, they tend to lose money. And you and I have spent time in the stock market. We've been in Bitcoin. I just continue to be hardened in my viewpoint that the best, most reliable, risk-adjusted, long-term wealth building plan is to find assets that you think are going to be long-term productive and siphon your cash flow into it over time and to stop touching your fucking money. Yep. TA, and like even excessive- you know, it can be <laughs> fun. It can be a lot of fun. But if you overdo it, you pay the piper. And we, you all know what I'm talking about here. It's going to totally. hurt. It's going to start. You're going to be chafing. You can't even walk for a day or so. You got to meter it back. Keep that thing in your pants. You know, don't touch you it. You get it. You get addicted to porn and masturbation. You don't want to have sex with your wife in Mexico. That's Shame. a problem. That is a problem. Um, thank God it's not me. I'm telling you. But <laughs> uh, like, it, it, yeah, too much. And you're, you're going to end up harming yourself. I mean, you, you said this some in what you wrote, but I feel the same way about macro analysis. People being bullish and then bearish and then bullish again and then I'm bearish again. Yeah. And hopping back well, and forth like a exactly. fucking this, hot potato. It's like, chill out. Other, Let's take a five, 10 year timeline here. This is not helpful for the average firefighter to be bullish in March and bearish mm. in July and flipping back and forth. Exactly. This, these are another sect of the crystal ball holders, and I give them a lot more credibility. And I'm not I'm certainly not talking shit about anybody, but we've both seen it. We've both seen the, you know, oh, I'm flipping bullish. I'm flipping bearish. And these happen very quickly. And you're like, I thought we had a long term view here. Why are we flipping bullish and bearish within a couple of month period and then flipping back bullish again? And like people are like, what the fuck am I supposed to do here? Why this guy who I have great respect for is telling me back and forth and jerking me around. And like eventually you just throw your hands up and you say, Okay, I get it. This guy really doesn't know. He's just kind of reading the tea leaves and making his best guess. And the the biggest problem with all of this, with TA, with macro analysis, with all of it, is black swans. And we have seen so many of them in the last yeah. in the last twenty years. We, I mean, how many can we count? We can count nine eleven, the great financial crisis, uh, COVID. We saw the the great money printing after COVID. All of these things. And, and when we saw Ukraine, now we're seeing Israel. Oh, and they seem to be picking up steam and they seem to be picking up, um, they seem to be happening with less time in between. 
I mean, that's a whole other conversation. But I the mean, point even I'm getting Josh, at even is just, just even that just you can't I make just, these decisions when right. black swans right, can right, land right. at any moment, or on the other side of it, a white swan. You know, Bitcoin's ETF could get approved tomorrow. Um, we've got uh, the having coming up in April. We've got the the Fed that is now kind of pausing, very likely to start reducing rates because they can't afford to pay the the five percent treasuries to roll over nine billion dollars. Those three catalysts, any one of them landing or the three of them landing in quick succession, we could see this thing rocket off to numbers that would be unbelievable six months ago. Yeah. So on either side of the spectrum, these people can be completely wrong simply because something happened in the market or in the world that was not expected that changes the game as far as the way people view this asset. You can get fucked over by both a black and a white swan. Is what you're saying. I mean, I, Even, I saw. I wouldn't recommend I, having both at the same time. <laughs> a swan, <laughs> swan menage a trois. Yeah, dude, a I, swan I, spit roast. I think, I mean, I saw a dude on Twitter a couple of weeks ago saying at Bitcoin at 36,000, really overextended, throwing shorts on, cautioning people against buying because of some Fibonacci line. Like, Ooh, that's I mean, another. <laughs> I was going to say, the, never short Bitcoin. Never do it. Yeah. Yeah. Do not do it. Either way, I was also going to say in terms of black swans, it's kind of back to what I was saying with with trading, right? People that, that just trade in general or swing trade, they think it sounds great because they've done it for five months successfully and they've gotten their first 19 trades directionally correct. Small, small uh, moves in the market that you didn't expect, just excessive leverage builds up and then unwinds and you just didn't foresee that because you were looking at lines on a chart Things are getting more volatile. Bitcoin's insanely volatile to start. And then today's economy and markets in general are are just incredibly volatile in a way they haven't been in decades. It's just a it's a very dangerous time to to excessively move money, to take leverage. And that's an I guess that's another point we could throw out. Don't short Bitcoin and do not we repeat, do not do lever up Don't. your fucking Bitcoin. OK, I, like if you want to play the game, though, do it with like a hundred bucks. Just do it with something that you can afford to lose because you're going to lose it. But then just go to the casino and pull the one arm bandit. Sure. Like when it, the only way that leverage makes sense is if you say, OK, you can lever up a very small percentage of your stack. But then the question becomes, what's the point of levering up in, in, in the first place? It's like picking up pennies in front of a steamroller. If you're just using a tiny percentage of your stack for leverage, there's no real point. If you're using a large percentage of your stack for leverage, now you are in crazy risk land. The number of examples is astounding. I, I don't know what to say. We could spend another half hour on this. Just trust Easily. us. Don't use leverage. A, when you're levering up, you're trusting a custodian. So a lot of yep. people using leverage have had their Bitcoin in places that it doesn't belong. B, because it's always shady places. You can't really do that in on Coinbase, at least not as far as I know. But honestly, I yeah. haven't been on Coinbase in years. It's usually like Binance and the really shady stuff where you have to like use a VPN to wormhole in over there. And then you have to, you know, take these ridiculous juggernaut swings at what seems like a softball pitch, right? But that, yes. that thing's got to spin on it that at the last second, it's going to dive down and you're going to miss. It's very likely. Yeah. The other thing is that the real pros, the real professional traders are out there to intentionally loose you of your levered Bitcoin. And, and I don't guarantee think you, that you Binance don't know as much as they that do. Purposely. Exactly. Yeah. Well, they're not only that, they're selling their book. Allegedly, this isn't something I know for sure, but I think it's very likely that when people put on these directional bets, there are professionals out there that are well aware of where the stopouts are and how they can manipulate things to push you right out and take your money. Don't yeah. think that that is not a possibility in this market. Let's take this back to why people are using leverage, which I think is a good transition into another point I want to make, Josh, which is people take leverage in these bull markets because they feel that they don't have enough Bitcoin. They have tremendous FOMO. They wish their stack was twice the size. And so they get twice as much Bitcoin, but take leverage, right? It's mm. behaviorally, they, they have this deep, you know, grief that they missed out or this FOMO. And so that's the impetus to lever up. And I think this is another thing we need to get to for the for the portion of the audience that is sitting there thinking they don't have enough Bitcoin. My first point I want to make 
everyone thinks they don't have enough Bitcoin. We both do not feel that we have enough Bitcoin. I feel like based on my conviction and the amount of time I've been studying this thing, I literally have the minimum amount possible. I'm bummed by that. I feel the same and way. That sob story is as old as Bitcoin. Almost the vast majority of, I mean, you have some OGs that got in at, at absurd numbers that have a very different story to tell. But my point is be grateful for what you have. And if you don't have any, be grateful that you know about Bitcoin right now. We're still so early in this adoption curve. Even if you just start buying, if this thing starts running and this is the first time you've made purchases, I think you still have significant upside and ability to, to grow your wealth. Don't make stupid decisions that put you and your family in bad long-term predicaments because you have some FOMO. Be grateful exactly. that you know about this asset at this time. Start accumulating continue accumulating <clears throat> yeah this gets us to time preference it's a it's a high time preference mentality to try to swing for the fences because you feel like you haven't acquired enough of this stuff and the time preference is a topic visited in bitcoin all the time and what i'm explaining with a low time pre time preference here is you're foregoing niceties of today for a better future it's back to like don't buy the lamborghini buy the apartment building you know what i mean Everything in this world that has been built to last has had has been built with a low time preference. You know, you talk about things like the the Great Pyramids, the Sphinx, uh, great pieces of art by Leonardo da Vinci that are worth half a billion dollars today if they were in fact made by him. Who knows? But the point I'm getting <laughs> at is those are not bananas taped to the wall. You know, like that is a think about the difference between modern art as as safe loves to do. And the Da Vinci, like these things, Da Vinci worked on for his entire life. The Mona Lisa was something that he put brush strokes on for 20 years. And a banana taped to a wall is something that we consider art today. And then Bitcoin in this kind of comparing it to these types of things. It is a digital artifact that has been crafted to perfection by a mysterious architect designed to last eons. And if civilization lasts, we'll have perfect fidelity into the future because no one can change it. No one can control it. It is anti-entropic by its nature. This is the epitome of low time preference craftsmanship. Bitcoin is a da Vinci in a field of bananas taped to a wall. So it's so obvious once the work is put in that it's embarrassing that more people don't find the value proposition. In stark contrast to this Bitcoin masterpiece, we have sand hills, what we call altcoins or shit coins. They've been built using Bitcoin's technology, but introducing entropy. Fidelity is lost in these altcoins because each of them has a founder or a group that controls them. When humans control something, they inevitably manipulate it. So most of these shitcoins have been designed from the outset to scam you. Some of them have leadership that is well-intentioned, but the fact that they have leadership is the problem. Bitcoin and its time chain have been designed to remove human leadership as their primary characteristic. So introducing humans into the mix causes entropy and destroys the value through seniorage, which is the problem that we have in the tra traditional finance system to begin with. So that's Amen. a long way of saying Amen. that Bitcoin is removing the human element, which is its, that's basically its primary purpose. It's an automated accounting system to remo remove humans from fucking it up. Yep. And these other guys are reintroducing the fuckery. That's really as simple as that. So having a low time preference allows us to not only not take some leverage, but to understand what we own, hold on to that pyramid, don't sell it. Mm, man, amen. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go on two separate little small monologues here now, too. Uh, <laughs> All right, go. So do not shitcoin. If you've been listening to this show for a long time and you, you call you, you're a newer quote unquote Bitcoin maxi, this is much easier said than done. Uh, I know that there's a lot more education out there that can short circuit this and, and put the blinders on and keep you away from this stuff. But if you've never been through a Bitcoin bull market, I don't think you understand how tempting this stuff is. Uh, there, there are going to be other coins. Very likely, maybe that was really the last altcoin run and, and things totally changed from here. My gut says no. 
Probably there not. are going to likely be coins that outperform and potentially massively outperform Bitcoin over the short and medium term. Uh, recency bias is sort of the headliner here. The, the top 10 crypto tokens from last, last cycle are going to be very different from the top 10 crypto tokens this cycle. The darlings of 2017, many of them didn't re reappear subsequently in 2021, and the same thing will happen over again. And here's, here's kind of an interesting take is even if the gains aren't transient, right? Even if there are some, some crypto projects that do have more staying power than we anticipate, the risk profile of those projects, Josh, is so much different than Bitcoin, far less proven than Bitcoin. In the midst of some of the highest sovereign debt loads, the highest sovereign debt loads really in 100 years, startling fiscal straitjacket that first world nation states find themselves in, it is very clear and obvious to the two of us and most of us in Bitcoin that there's going to be a demand for a fixed supply, robustly decentralized, immutable ledger where humans aren't in control, like you just said. Mm. On the crypto side, it's far less, e even if I'm as nice as I can be to the broader crypto space, the use case for the tokenization of all sorts of other assets, smart contracts, moving S NFTs around, these sorts of ideas are, are far more unproven sources of demand. So my point is that even if something does outperform Bitcoin and it outperforms it for longer than you anticipate, I'm just suggesting that the risk profile is so much different than Bitcoin. Be careful, oh. stay focused on the real innovation, what the actual use case is here that, that isn't prompting you to take way more risk than you need. Mm. Um, well, the other point I wanted to make, which I know you'll have a lot to add to, is we, we, as you suggested so eloquently, what we have here in Bitcoin has the potential to be one of, if the, if not the most pristine asset on the planet. It has the potential to have staying power for not years, but decades, centuries plus. Who no, who knows? That's unproven, but that it has potential with the magnitude of innovation that it is to be here for a long time. And so you need to be thinking through how you custody and protect yes, something that could be this pristine for this long. Let, let's get into sort of what a bull run uh, prompts people to do from a custody mm. standpoint, because I, I think this pushes doors, people yeah. in, a, in, a, in, a, in a positive, but also you got to be careful sort of direction. Yeah, absolutely. This is something everybody does when they're brand new you know it's you believe that you own bitcoin because you went on the exchange say coinbase and you bought you know 0 0.01 bitcoin you spent 100 bucks or whatever and now the number on the screen goes to 0 0.001 bitcoin and you own that bitcoin but fundamentally if you read the fine print and we have some good friends that have been caught up in this trap door you don't own that Bitcoin, just like as a, when you have a bank account, the money that you keep in that bank, that $10,000 or whatever amount of money you keep in your bank account, it is not yours. You're loaning it to the bank. The bank yes. has property rights that are, it's a very convoluted, very complicated thing. The point is the bank's got some FDIC insurance. They're going to print the money. They're going to give you the money. Coinbase or any of these exchanges, I don't care which one, how, however great their credibility is at this point, FTX a year ago had... People believe that they were the most legitimate place to trade these assets. Yes. It was viewed as the, I guess, Goldman Sachs of the space, right? This was the city on the hill as far as like best professional trading app out there, FTX. What happened to them in a very short period of time? Obviously, they had you know been fucking around for a long time. But when it actually hit the road, when the, when the shit flew and the fan was on full speed... <laughs> When that shit hit that fan, it took literally one or two days for the whole thing to be exploded. And if your money was there, my brother actually had like $10,000. He had, he had cash sitting on FTX. He got it out the day that SBF was saying, everything's fine. Everything's good here. No, don't worry about FTX. It's all good. He got his money out three hours before they shut everything down. He got super lucky. A good friend of ours did not get so lucky. He was caught up in this whole thing. He lost a lot of money, and it was really painful to watch it happen. Basically, the point is, if you're not custodying this money, if this money is sitting on an app at an exchange, it is not your Bitcoin. It is paper yes. Bitcoin. It is 
it, the old saying in Bitcoin is not your seat, not your keys, not your coins. So if you don't take custody, and what do we mean by custody? If you're new here, it's a complicated ordeal. Like we have episode six of our basic series that will goes through for about an hour and a half of what self custody is. We're not going to flog this thing completely here. The point is, is there is to put it very simply a password that you create with a small USB device. Cold card is the one that we recommend. It is the best in the business. You, it creates a seed phrase. You save the seed phrase. You use it to sign transactions. It keeps your Bitcoin password separate from your computer, which is very dangerous to keep money on your computer because you could be hacked. Somebody could get into your computer. They could steal all your money. So this thing holds your seed keys, your passphrase, your secret identity that allows you to spend your Bitcoin, which is your Bitcoin. That is, it's imperative that you get your money on something like that, your Bitcoin. If you don't, you're leaving yourself open to exchange failure. If you have it on your computer, you're leaving yourself open to getting hacked or making a dumb decision that could lose you your money. Self-custody in this space is imperative. And there's lots of ways to do it. There's tons of different avenues you can go down. There's lots of different companies that produce these devices. A place we would also recommend you go to learn about this, BTC Sessions YouTube videos. He has amazing videos walking you through all of the intricacies of this. And it is actually very simple. You just have to put in an hour of your time. One hour yeah. will get you totally good to go. Folks, when a fellow firefighter, family member, or friend asks us where we buy Bitcoin, we point them to Swan. It's the place Josh and I have dollar cost average into Bitcoin for years. At Swan Bitcoin, you can set up automated Bitcoin savings plans as well as execute instant purchases. They serve clients of any size, from firefighters to institutional investors, and an account is startlingly easy to set up. I've watched a fireman do it on a smartphone while sitting in a recliner in less than seven minutes. Swan also offers Bitcoin IRAs. You can start or roll over a traditional or Roth IRA with enterprise-grade custody, attentive service, easy onboarding, and transparent fees. Visit swan.com for details on everything that Swan offers. Ladies and gents, the fact is that Bitcoin remains decentralized because its ledger is distributed all across the globe. The thousands of computers that keep track of who owns what and ensure the accuracy of the Bitcoin blockchain are the nodes. You ought to be verifying your own transactions and balances, as well as enforcing the consensus rules yourself. The software and hardware we use to run Bitcoin nodes is StartOS by Start9 Labs. With StartOS, you can fire up a full Bitcoin node in a very easy plug-and-play fashion, but you can also do way more. Start9 gives you optional capabilities to run a full-blown private server, allowing you to easily and incrementally level up and opt out of today's increasingly centralized an alarmingly censored cloud computing model. Just as Windows and Mac OS made it possible for anyone to run their own personal computer, StartOS makes it possible for anyone to have their own personal server. Run a Bitcoin node, run a Lightning node, run an Oster relay, control your own photos, videos, and messages, and much more. Check it all out at start9.com. Yeah, I, I totally agree that the the risk of custodial or of uh brokerage collapse is going to be Big. equal in the next cycle because if you're if you picture bitcoin at hundreds of thousands of dollars leverage and foul play and and greed are going to proliferate I, maybe there's some more regulatory oversight after what happened to FTX. I'm just saying, I think we're more in the first or second inning than the, than the fourth or fifth inning than people imagine. And most of the fans are still out getting beers and hot dogs. They're not paying much attention to the game. And when the excitement really starts to build, you're going to have equaled clownsmanship, if not more. And that's going to bring risk. And you're going to have all these different you know, Bitcoin brokers offering yield and competing in the same way. I just don't see that changing. And so there's going to be risk no matter where you buy your Bitcoin. I mean, it, it's generally a good, a good practice, as we would say, to, to buy from a Bitcoin only mm. uh, broker. Like we choose Swan. But there's nobody's immune. And Swan would be the first person to say that. That's why Swan's constantly saying, 
If you buy your Bitcoin here, get it into self-custody. And they have over 80% of the Bitcoin purchase there whisked off into Mm self-custody. Buy from a place that's Bitcoin only. They're less likely to be to be wrapped up in in a huge tornado, but also buy from a place that's constantly encouraging you to self-custody. There is no one size fits all solution to custody. I agree, Josh. It's simpler Mm -hmm. than a lot of people imagine. But there is some degree of responsibility and onus on you. This asset is exactly. not like the traditional system. You have to do some homework and you're going to need to experiment. You're going to need to explore. I, I think if you're intimidated by self custody, at the very least, I'll kind of end with this comment about self custody. You have to start the process of learning so that the, at the very least, <clears throat> you can withdraw your Bitcoin if you need to and you're not scrambling last minute. I guess one other thing I'd be remiss not to throw in is also don't get out over your skis. You have to be thinking about inheritance planning. Back to this being a very pristine asset that could really stand the test of time. Ask yourself this question with your self-custody. Who is your weakest link? If you die in a car accident today, what happens to your Bitcoin? How does your wife get it? How do your kids get it? Think that through and don't make your 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 permanent setup any more complicated than your weakest link. You can experiment with your own more more complex deal on the side, but maybe you're able to set up a sparrow wallet multi-sig and do all this stuff, but your wife's unable to do that. So you need to be more single sig or you need collaborative custody. And if these words don't mean anything to you, <clears throat> then you need to start learning yes. how this works. And that what you just said there is the final point that I really want to get into um, before we wrap this up, which is education. Swan, you mentioned them. They are an incredible resource for education. You can buy your Bitcoin there. You can read a myriad of articles that they produce with a bunch of, they have a shit ton of really cool Bitcoiners working for them that write some of the best articles in the space. Great education. We're doing this to educate people. Get educated on this topic about, not just about self-custody, but about Bitcoin in general, you want to understand fundamentally why this is important. You want to understand why you should own it. You want to understand how it works because when shit hits the fan, like what happened with FTX, that was an incredible buying opportunity. If you understood the lay of the land, sure was. We we sat there and looked at this and said, okay, the market is throwing a fit. FTX is completely illegitimate. They've blown up. Bitcoin is massively affected. It's down double digits that day or, you know, that week. It hit its bottom at around 16,000 some odd number. Sitting here from our perspective, having been in this for six years at the time, having understood what's really fundamentally going on here, we understand this is bullshit. Bitcoin is unaffected here. There's no reason that Bitcoin should be affected. The only reason it actually is, is because the market itself doesn't, there's so many uneducated people in the market that they think that this is affecting Bitcoin. And also, you know, that FTX had to sell a bunch of Bitcoin to prop themselves up. But that's beside the point. The point is, if you fundamentally understand what you're buying here, you see something like FTX blowing up as an opportunity to increase your stack at a time when it is ripe. And it, and let me tell you, there's about three different times in my experience in this asset that have felt really shitty. It was when FTX blew up. It was when COVID happened and this thing hit like $3,500. And it was after 2017's bull run in like 2018 and 2019. And somewhere in that period of time, it went down to like 2,500 or 3,000. It sucked. All three of those times would have been amazing buying opportunities. I didn't take as much advantage of the 2018 19 time period as I should have. I didn't take advantage of the 2020 time period as I should have. And yep. I, again, did not take advantage of the 2020, was it 2022 when FTX blew up? None of those. I each time though, I did take better steps, but I still don't feel like I did what I should have done. And if you don't understand what you're buying here, you're very likely selling at that time, which is the exact opposite of what you want to be doing. So education in this space, above all the other things that we just said throughout the last hour, is absolutely head and shoulders more more important than any of this other stuff. Make sure you understand what you are buying. Yes, I totally agree. My main two regrets are the COVID liquidity shock. I never, I've never sold any Bitcoin. I'm proud of that. 
but I have I absolutely regret not buying more, particularly during the COVID liquidity shock. And then again in the FTX collapse, although we did I I was scooping hard. Hindsight's yeah. always 2020. And that's back sure to is. my point. If everybody feels like they don't have enough Bitcoin, and a word to those people out there that think when Bitcoin drops back to X number, that's when I'll purchase. Once again, psychology is get a there. fickle bitch because when it goes back down to that number, like when we were down at whatever the number was, 15,000, whatever, everybody's calling for sub 10,000. And so mm-hmm. you're thinking, oh, no, I'll just wait for sub 10. Back to the DCA point, just buy over time. I like your approach. If you want to, if you want to get a little bit involved, just up your DCAs when you think it's a good opportunity and decrease them when you think the market's getting frothy, but get yourself yep. out of your own way. Absolutely. I think my closing point, Yeshua, is <laughs> just the general message of in a Bitcoin bull run, if and when it occurs, stay humble and be gracious throughout this market. Okay. Yes. First off, Bitcoin is not for sure. I finished Lynn's book, Broken Money, on the beach in Mexico at the Rio Latino Resort in uh, Costa Mujeres. Shout out to the staff there. Uh, and <laughs> I, I'm, th- I'm on page 411. And she has this whole section, cryptocurrency risk analysis, which is basically a Bitcoin risk analysis. This section made my butthole pucker. And I've heard Lynn explore this stuff before. We've done full episodes on Bitcoin risk analysis. We're early. This thing's only 15 years old. Even if the price goes up to $500,000, Josh, it doesn't mean that Bitcoin's a guarantee. It doesn't mean that there couldn't be issues that arise. I encourage you to read this book. I encourage you to read that section. I encourage you to keep your eyes open and stop using and thinking about words as inevitable and guaranteed. Yes. And it's also... Before you move on from that point, I orange pilled a family member last night who I've been I've talked to on and off about Bitcoin for years. He's in his mid 50s. He's not somebody he's very risk averse. But this time, I actually don't think he knew I had this podcast. So I was telling him about this and he's like, wait, what is it about? And I told him and he's like, oh, so I'm explaining some make this quick here, explaining some basic points about Bitcoin in a way that I'm trying to think, like, how is this guy going to receive this? Well, yeah, the thing that got him was number one, I fully admitted that. Yeah, it could totally fail. Totally. Yes. Like, I'm not 100% confident. And that got him. He was like, okay, well, this guy's not a complete idiot because he understands that he's not 100% right all the time. The other thing that really got him was the sharp ratio idea that you can just own 2% and 98% cash and you can outperform the S&P. And that he was on Swan before the hour was over buying, setting up a DCA after that sharp ratio idea. And I have to credit Preston Pish for that one. But there are, there's always different ways that you can approach people, kind of size them up and see what it is that will kind of tip them over the edge. Anyway, I digress. Move on with your, uh, your point. Yeah, there. no, it's, it's a, you're in the orange pilling realm. Don't have the same script for everyone is, I think, a great message. Listen to people actually have a real conversation, meet them where they're at. And also, this is this is part of being gracious. Listen to what they have to say. If you're just. 100% confident in Bitcoin and you encounter a smart, thoughtful individual that disagrees with you, take a time out, chill for a second, listen to what they have to say. Be constantly on the lookout for vulnerabilities of this thing. Steel man Bitcoin, even if the price surges to your wildest dreams. Another comment I'm going to say on the humble, gracious side, don't celebrate global implosion. This really irritates mm. and irks me. When I was flying back from Mexico, Last night, it was a it was a clear night and I was looking down on cities in the middle of the night. I don't know how many how many thousand feet would we have been at, Josh? You're the aviation guy. Thirty five. Thirty five thousand feet. I could see down on metropolitan Cincinnati, Indianapolis, Atlanta. These are all cities I was passing, tracking them on my phone. And I'm just sitting there going. The world is absolutely massive. Our species is incredible what we've done. And every single one of those lights down there is reflective of a family or or a group of people that are just like me, that are trying to live another day, raise a family, whatever. These are real people out there around the globe. And I know that we're in a, a potentially dire concerning financial environment. Don't sit around rooting for global financial implosion. 
support solutions in the world that don't all that don't use the word Bitcoin. <laughs> Bitcoin's not the only thing here. Okay. Yeah. I just when, when people get so obsessed with Bitcoin and so averse to fiat that I think they they really it's dehumanizing in a lot of ways. It becomes about them and their stack and their freedom and their sovereignty. I'm just saying if Bitcoin does roll out and start to kind of usurp and replace traditional financial rails and system and pain comes with it, be gracious, right? And mm. maybe that means generosity. If the world's struggling and your Bitcoin stack is through the roof, consider being generous. Find a nonprofit. Maybe it's Bitcoin related. Maybe it's not. Support people in need. Um, I think just one other point I want to make here is just graciousness for those in your own life. I am prepared, and my wife has heard me say, I'm prepared to feel some grief. Legitimately, I think that's the word that comes to mind. If Bitcoin really surges, I am personally going to be very, very disappointed that some people really close to me in my life didn't make a decision to even take small hedge positions. I, I just, as the years have gone on, I've, I've realized I just, I can't beat the, the door down incessantly. If people aren't willing to do any research, research yeah. or take any suggestions, I can't force people to own Bitcoin. But enough people know I'm into it. Enough people know I'm up to this thing with this podcast that if the price even, let's, let's say the price goes to $100,000, a lot of these people are going to be knocking on my door wanting to purchase Bitcoin. Instead of me going, are you fucking kidding me? Why didn't you buy last year? Yep. Everyone's got this situation. Accept that with open arms. Stay positive and enthusiastic and express the opportunity that now exists for them to buy Bitcoin. That's going to be hard for a lot of us, though, that have been at dinner parties for the last three years <laughs> saying people should buy it. Nobody did. Be gracious when they come back into the fold. Price is yep. the great teacher. It probably taught you to begin with. It's going to teach other people again. You were just a seed planner. And then the, and then the price surged and the tree started to grow. And now they're curious, be their resource in that environment. Last point. Bitcoin's going to get a lot bigger than it is right now, Josh. There's going to be a yes. lot more people involved in Bitcoin. It's going to expand way beyond your group. On Noster and on Twitter, I see people thinking that Bitcoin's my group's money, right? If you think Bitcoin reflects conservative ideals, expect more liberals to feel the opposite. If you think Bitcoin reflects Republican ideals, expect Democrats to feel the opposite. If you think Bitcoin reflects Christian ideals, expect a lot more atheists and agnostics to feel it's the opposite and reflects their worldview. Bitcoin is for fucking everybody. And when something this open and momentous happens in society, the way Bitcoin could, it's going to just fit the eye of the beholder and tons of people you disagree with across many swaths of society are going to be using, accepting and talking about this coin that you disapprove of. Mm. Right. So just be ready for Bitcoin to outgrow you, I guess, is yeah. my main message there. I mean, let's hope it does, because otherwise um, it's, it's like we both said multiple times. This is one of two things. We're either completely wrong and this thing goes to zero. <laughs> <laughs> or we're completely right, and this thing goes to numbers that will seem absurd to us even today. I don't see a middle ground. I don't really see a way that can can work out. And either one of those two directions is the most likely. Don't know exactly which yet, but I feel very, very <laughs> strongly that it's going to be to the upside. Um, just how, I want to just quickly review some of the things that I think were important about this chat. Yes, education number one: get educated, read books, listen to podcasts. But don't listen. I mean, basically, don't make financial decisions based on what other people tell you. Dan and Josh are firemen. We're not professional financial advisors. You make decisions for yourself about your finances. Don't YOLO 100% of your portfolio into Bitcoin because we said to. And we didn't say that, by the way. Um, DCA, very important. It allows you to keep your psychology in check while accumulating. Have a low time preference. Build things slowly that will last. Self-custody. Get off exchanges. And I would recommend not buying Bitcoin that you don't control. I would not prefer to buy an ETF. I would not prefer to have it in a way that I can't directly control it. Take risk that you can afford. Don't put more money in this than you can afford to lose. Even though I don't think you will lose it, you might panic and lose it. 
buy assets, not liabilities. And we didn't even really get to this one, but it's pretty simple. Don't share with people how much Bitcoin you have. Yeah, because it could be very risky in the in the in the near future or the long term future to tell people how much you have. It's just not smart. Don't tell people. Don't brag. Don't let ego get in the way of your privacy and potential safety. Don't tell people. Yeah. That's what I have <laughs> to summarize this thing. Love it. Yeah. Stay humble and stack sats. A lot of people As forget Odell the says. stay humble part. I love yes. that last point. If you're gonna, if Bitcoin goes to a crazy number. People that are right, that have struggled for a long time and then come out on top, they want to gloat. You're going to be tipsy at a dinner party at some point when Bitcoin's at a really high number and you're going to want to insinuate or suggest that you have a lot of it and you're right. Mm. Don't do that. Stay Dumb. dead quiet. Indicate to people that you own way less of this than you do because I'm telling you, word travels. And if these, if these coins go to seven figures... Those people that you told tipsy at a dinner party, you're going to tell other people and who knows who might hear. I, I think there's legitimately good reasons to be somewhat paranoid. Now, don't be overly paranoid, but I think yeah. a, a, a small dose of paranoia is healthy. Okay. Don't gloat. Yeah. Dan and I see how quickly rumors can spread at a 50 dude firehouse. Trust me, that shit will be. I mean, if I tell someone some juicy shit about Dan, he's going to know I did it like six hours later like maybe less <laughs> for, <laughs> so for, for don't sure. tell people shit man they will you'd be surprised how quickly those branches can reach out to people you don't want to know yeah um otherwise though stay humble and stack stats as dan said and odell i believe has coined that phrase that is the best wisdom in the space and the shortest mm. most concise best wisdom in the space don't be stupid just keep stacking dca I like how we thought we were going to keep this to 40 minutes. I knew there was no <laughs> chance that was the case. Uh, this is a throwback. Yeah. This is how this podcast started. I don't know how yeah. many episodes we did this in a row. Fun, it was just man. the two of us. It's been a pleasure. I think it was maybe like we'll do 10 it again. or 12. Yeah, maybe Give us we some should feedback. Be a... If you hate hearing the two of us jab to each other, you can tell us. If you like it and you want more of us, more of it, let us know. It makes it a lot um, easier for us. We don't have to go begging people to come on our show. You're right. <laughs> yeah, for sure. All right. All right. Let's sunset this motherfucker. See ya. See ya.